Welcome. This is a very important session for us. You may remember that one year ago, we launched the decarbonizing transport project. It seemed something very ambitious. And a lot of people have told us during this year, it seems very nice, but probably too ambitious. We want to see what you can do. Well, today is the first day in what you will see what we have been doing. And of course, I am not the most unbiased person to speak about what we've been doing. But I'm so proud. And I hope you will be very satisfied when we see what our team has been doing. But before we go into that, I would like to invite to come to the stage Laura de la Croce, who is here replacing Patricia Espinosa, who had a transport problem because of the weather, because of the thunderstorms um, in this part of Germany yesterday. She has lost the flight connections and she could not be here on time. But she's well replaced. Laura, please come us and give us the perspective of UNFCCC. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm reading the speech which would have been delivered by the Executive Secretary of the UNFCCC Secretariat. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, let me first thank the International Transport Forum for inviting me to be part of your 2017 summit. Let me also thank all of the member states and everyone here who is working to make the Decarbonizing Transport Initiative successful. I was a delegate at last year's summit where Decarbonizing Transport was launched, so it is exciting to see the progress that has been made in its first year. This initiative engages all stakeholders and visually shows what proposed policies will do, an inclusive approach that connects benefits to people with national contributions to the Paris Agreement. This, this is useful for policymakers who need to know the emission reductions and livability gains that policy changes will accomplish. This integrated approach to climate change and sustainable development recognizes our on-the-ground reality, and it opens the door to transform that reality. I welcome the opportunity to celebrate this first year and accelerate action. With the Paris Agreement ratified by 147 countries, now is the moment to turn climate commitments into concrete action. In some places, it is already happening. Countries are switching to all electric car sales. International aviation is flying thousands of biofuel flights per year and working on a carbon pricing mechanism. From car shares and bike lanes to efficiency standards and electric fleet vehicles, local governments are transforming transport in their communities. All of this is very encouraging, but one look at the countless congested and polluted cities around the world shows it is not enough to meet our challenge. To truly raise to the challenge, we must advance work in several crucial areas. First, we need long-term plans. We must catch the roadmaps to low emission, highly efficient transport that makes sense for each country's circumstance. Long-term strategies provide a framework for planning and policy as part of a well-managed transition in line with our global climate and sustainability goals. Second, we need immediate and urgent action. This is a new and dynamic era, the era of implementation. There are more avenues for action now than ever before, and many innovative and common sense solutions. Bonn, Germany, the host city of this year COP23, which will be presided over by the government of Fiji, needed a few new buses, so they got electric buses. 
I was recently in Delhi where the city metro is putting solar panels on their facilities and the railroad ministry in India plans to do something similar. These steps might seem small, rethinking procurement, reimagining how existing facilities are used, but every step takes us closer to the vision agreed in Paris. Every step takes us closer to seizing the great opportunity we have. The recent OECD Investing in Climate, Investing in Growth report estimates that transport comprises 43% of the $95 trillion the world will invest in infrastructure through 2030. That same report says that integrating the Sustainable Development Goals and Paris Agreement action raises economic output a full percentage point by 2021. And by some estimates, we open $12 trillion in economic opportunity by moving to climate-safe, sustainable development. We also deliver lasting social and economic benefits to the community. The well-being of people, what people and communities tend to gain underscores the urgent need to act, to seize this opportunity and to transform reality. I encourage everyone to use resources like decarbonizing transport, make long-term plans and take immediate action. Take climate action now. I also encourage you to build partnerships. Working together and sharing what works empowers every country and community to realize their own low emission transport success. Together, we can transform transport and build low emission resilient societies where opportunity is open to all and peace and prosperity flourish. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, let me see where are my slides. So we move now to oop, the presentation that we have. We will be dividing it in two parts. I will be giving you the kind of strategic framework. And then my colleague, Yari Kaupila, will present you the more operational part of the model and how it is support, supposed to be in support of the dialogue and what is the kind of almost gaming experience that you can have by using that model. And then we will have some of our partners who've been supporting and will be supporting the development of the model speak up about how they see this project. So the first thing is introduction to the project. This is a slide I showed last year. This was our vision for how the project should be and I must say I'm very happy that it seems we got it right. We wanted to have a project that would cover essentially two pillars, the quantitative side in which we would be developing the models and linking them together and be able to produce rigorous results of what would be the consequences of different measures and their combination and a inclusive part, the dialogue part, in which we would be working with the decision makers so that it would be possible to make the best use of the model in support of their choice of decisions. There were, of course, more slides. There is a word that is not here that is very, very important in our whole attitude towards this, which is we want totally to be non-prescriptive. We will not be saying to each country what they should be doing. We will be helping them in find what is their choice for what they think they should be doing. On the progress that has been happening, we now have, as of two days ago, 141 parties have submitted their first national determined contributions. Some of them have already done their, I would say, evolution from the Paris Agreements in December 2015. Some have not yet done it. So there was a total of 188. Of those, 141 have already done the kind of second version. But if we look at the 188, including those refreshed 100 or updated 141, 
What we see is that 86% just provide an economy-wide assessment of what they expect to achieve. 80% mention the transport sector. 60% provide transport mitigation measures. And please look there at these inverted columns because measures, as we will see, is not always meaning what you think it means. And 9% provide a quantified CO2 reduction target for transport. But measures in that sense is not exactly what most of us would take as measures. Sometimes they are desired outcomes. Like, for instance, I want to increase the market share of public transport in my main cities to 30%. This is more an ambition, a desired outcome, than a measure. Some others remain rather vague or very high level. We want to have cleaner fuels in transport, things like that. And in some cases, the mitigation potential of the measures indicated there is not exactly aligned with what we know is achievable with those kinds of measures. So we are in a kind of fuzzy landscape. However, it's good that, as I said, 80% of them mention transport as part of their areas of concern, if you allow me that. We have been developing our models and trying to see what would be the carbon reduction potential of those measures or quasi-measures. We had developed in our transport outlook that was presented a few months ago the baseline scenario, what would be the trends of carbon emissions assuming a business as usual conduct, but the business as usual already includes the technological progress as we've been observing. So it's not just pro projecting trade and population, but keeping the technology of today is also projecting the technological evolution as we see it today. And then we developed for this purpose of the decarbonizing transport project, something that we call a low carbon scenario, in which we include all currently expectable transport carbon reduction policies and measures, all of them are being put in place. And if this is done, this brings us very close to the two degree scenario for 2030 as calculated by the International Energy Agency. But we are far from reaching the two degree scenario for 2050. Let me show you this graphic. The first column, so this is million tons of carbon um, emissions. The first column represents 2015. The second one is our baseline scenario as calculated in the outlook. The third one is the scenario coming out of the NDCs, the National Determined Contributions, as presented. And this includes our, how should I call it, very generous translation of those measures into effective carbon reductions. Saying for each of them, what's the best translation possible of those intentions and ambitions into measures? How much would that achieve? And you see that that reduces something like 1,500 million tons from the baseline scenario, so not bad. It's not too far away from the two degree scenario, only 400 million tons. So an additional 20% reduction from what would be the NDC scenario. And then if we want to go to our low carbon scenario, which is maximum push to all the best knowledge available today, at the speed that it could be deployed to 2030, we would still be able to reduce another 700 million tons. So this gives you a picture that we would be not far from the two degree scenario by having all the countries apply to the best possible their ambitions in due time and in good efficiency. It means a little more ambition and very good implementation would probably put us in place for 2030. For reasons of time, we are not showing you here our analysis for 2050, but it is a lot more pessimistic. Essentially, it says we need to go much bolder after 2030. 
the kind of progress and measures that we are having here is simply not enough. But that's not a surprise. And it's not even too worrying because simply the level of transformations between now and 2030 will be such that many possible measures in 2030 are not even identifiable today. So we have to be really determined to get to very good results by 2030 and very attentive to what would be possible to do after that. So maybe in five years time, eight years time, we should be knowing enough of what should be possible to start seriously looking at what we should be doing from 2030 on. What do we see? So here the national determined contributions, they provide these ambitions, but not the measures. They do not attain exactly the results we wanted, but it's not too far. And we need disruptive solutions after 2030. So that's in a package what we have. We've developed this simulator suite. And for that, you will have here a brief uh, presentation. The idea is to have the identification of specific policy packages that could, for each particular country or region, bring them to the level of uh, carbon reduction that they have set out, or even more, and then start, when the model is more advanced than today, explore other bolder forms of intervention to help the bridge the gap to the two degree scenario in 2050 or even to the 1.5 degree scenario earlier than that. This is a graph that we had not exactly in this form, but in a similar form already a year ago, showing the process in which you go from, let me see if this works, it does. You have here the high level policies, an identification of measures, what the countries expect to achieve. We put those measures in our model and we estimate the impact and we see are they good enough, fit enough, uh, similar enough, okay? Otherwise we have to say, sorry, but our model which is independent, which we hope is not biased, says what you should expect is not as optimistic as you have there. Maybe we should talk a little on the backstage. And then we go into the dialogue process. We have here something that uh, Yari will be talking about, the catalog of measures in which we've been compiling a lot of information. We bring those together in a selective way. We help by this process the decision makers to make their selection and we revise the whole thing. In the dialogue, it is very important to know that any political decision maker or even a company, a large company, has to make a compatible a choice of something that is compatible at the same time being carbon effective, but also it has to be politically acceptable because ministers like to be reelected. But also it has to be realistically a plan, a realistic plan in terms of the financial dimension. Can we afford the investment needed? And only not, not only that, it also has to be compatible with the, cap the ca technical capacities, the managerial capacities of that society. So it's the combination of these constraints in dialogue with the model that says how much you can achieve on carbon reduction that should help each decision maker to find the path to get to those objectives. That's the way we see it. As I said, we don't want to dictate the results for anybody. We want to help them find their way. That's the whole purpose of our exercise. Let me say that in this process, we've been using the catalog of measures, building on the results that one of our partners, which was uh, Slowcat, has done the kind of starting work and we've been building on that. And what we will be showing you is the simulator for the urban mobility part but this is not all that we have. We have the underlying models. I would say two thirds at least rather ready and one third in final stages of development for all the transport modes, all the ranges. And then we put this kind of umbrella on top of that based on a high number of simulations that we have there. And so that what we, the results you have here is a kind of interpolation between the points that have already been calculated by those models. 
We will show only the urban mobility simulator because it's the area which is easier for all of us to understand what it is because we're all urban inhabitants and because it is the one that has more studies, more data already available. But this is a kind of a appetizer for what will be coming uh, in later years, already next year, suddenly covering all the modes and all the ranges. That should be a lot easier. But something I should have done at the beginning, and I deeply apologize, which is I should have thanked our partners. The projections was there. I should have started by that. This work has been funded almost exclusively up to now by the Corporate Partnership Board. Thank you, guys. Very, very important. And we are now starting to get some funding from the countries. Thank you again for that. This is very important. And we are now also starting to get funding from professional associations. Thank you. Um, those fundings are essential so that we can do this. The target for us is to have a significant contribution given two years from now, only two years from now, 2019, because that's when the real negotiations start for the COP2020, in which the revision of the commitments made in Paris in 2015 will happen. So we have to have, if we th all of us think this is a serious effort, we have to have the results at a significant scale of reach and confidence on the results two years from now. That's a huge effort. And that has to be funded. Our regular budget is totally occupied with other things. So thank you very much for the confidence you had on us. And I hope that after seeing this, more countries, more associations, more entities will want to be a partner in this process because that's the way that we can help so many countries, so many stakeholders to bring their decisions. Now, Yari, please. Thank you, Jose, um, and good, good, good day to everybody. Uh, so very briefly, I'll present our urban mobility simulator. As Jose said, this is a visualization tool which is working on a large set of results that we obtain from our underlying transport models. So the model, when you see me working on the, on the tool, the model itself is not used at that point, but we're visualizing the results of the model, uh, just for the fact that we haven't been able to yet make the models run so fast that it would happen in real time. But we hope to do that in the future as well. Um, our aim here is to increase the transparency and the relevance of the project, and we feel that this is a dissemination tool, an exchange of data and information with our partners in the first stage about the effective measures, about what works and what doesn't work. And the tool has three elements. It has the data explorer, which gives you information in the, about the da data in the, in the cities that are included in the model today. Our urban model itself has around 1,600 cities included. So for each of these cities, it shows the data. We have the catalog of effective measures, the explore policy measures in this case, that, that shows the, the, the sort of really the key element of the project as well. And then we have the simulation tool, what, what Josie uh, talks about as a game. Let's see if I can play the game, but, uh, but we, we're getting there. Uh, so just to mention that this is the first version up to date. This is work in progress. Uh, we'd be very happy to hear your comments, your views. Uh, it includes the first set of policy measures uh, and first set of impacts analyzed. Uh, we're looking at, at the moment, only direct emissions. Uh, we're not looking at life cycle uh, analysis at this point. We have not included safety or access into the model yet, but these are also some of the things we will be doing in the future. So let me start by the uh, city explorer or the data explorer. This gives you an overview really on the diversity of the cities that are included in the model and in our urban model. In terms of their size, in their income levels, or by car ownership level. This is the graphs we decided to show in the front place. We, we can change all that. We have collected a huge amount of data for the cities and, 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 and this really we feel is a way to disseminate that. So what it does, it provides information on some of the inputs we have in the models that are used and we will update this accordingly as we uh, build the model. And we hope that it gives also transparency about what, what really is put in, in place. 
and, and we have all the cities above 200,000 population in this, and, and how it works. For example, you see already now that in the cities about 200,000 population, we, we talk a lot about the urban, urban, urban areas and, and a lot of the challenges in big cities, but if you look at the global cities, most of them are small cities. Uh, un, by small, un, under one million uh, inhabitants. Uh, so with the tool, you can first of all have a look where these small cities are located. And each of the clusters shows the number of cities in that cluster uh, at the moment. You can see where the small cities with low income and with the low car ownership. And you can identify uh, in, in, a, in a very nice way to really get the characteristics of the cities as well. Uh, going back, you can also look at the results uh, by region. We're showing the results at the moment by region, but the model again works at the city level, at the national or city level. Uh, we can go to Latin America, we can zoom in to the city, and as we zoom in, the, the bars will change automatically and showing the, the dynamics, but you can go to the level of uh, individual cities, actually, and get information of each city on the right. Right now we're showing just the population, the density of the city and the income level. Uh, but we're cleaning the data that we have collected and we will be putting in place here the data about the transport network lens, the public transport stops, uh, and, and, and so on. So all the data that we have underlying the models, we will be sharing with this tool. And we hope this gives transparency, but also gives the feedback to us from the users. Are we having the right assumption? Are we having the right data for these cities that we look at? So this is the one first part of the model, uh, the tool. The second one is the the, the catalog of effective measures. This really is the key element of the whole decarbonizing transport project, is the catalog. Uh, so here we're showing right now the, the measures that we've, uh, we've done a, a very relatively large and, and wide desktop study research on existing knowledge on what is effective, what are the measures that are available for urban policies and how effective they are. And for each measure we, we're including at the moment, we have uh, here the catalog. For each measure, uh, well, the, the idea here again is that, that it gives transparency regarding the assumptions that we actually use in the modeling side, which I'll show you later. Uh, at least it, it also shows the effect of each of the measure. So for each measure, you can click on it, you'll get the idea here on what's our progress to date in collecting quantitative evidence. Here on parking pricing, this is our subjective assessment, but we feel that the evidence we've collected from the existing studies and, 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 and countries is, is relatively high. Uh, in terms of the geographical coverage of the, of the knowledge, we're not that confident. We think we should be improving that. And, and we hope that these bars will work as a guidance to our partners as well, and to us, that where we still need to be working more generally. And, and then the last bar shows the progress in terms of how we uh, included that into our transport models. And, and in this case, it's included in, in, in its all uh, characteristics. For each, each of the measure, we have a short overview. Um, what is aim, aim of the measure it is? What are the average CO2 benefits coming from the studies here? We look at, in general, a 10% increase in parking prices result in a 1% to 3% decrease in demand for parking. Again. Behind this is a huge amount of data we collected for each of the cities we looked at, having what was the characteristics of a city, how many people were there, where, how the study was done, what was the effect that, that gives us. So this is an overview. This is not the one number exact that we're using necessarily in the model, but the model works on a regional basis and, and a city basis. We also look at the costs of providing parking measures. What are the costs? So you can start, start getting an idea based on the other uh, work that has been done elsewhere. Uh, what are the other co-benefits for sustainable development? That was one of the parts that the decarbonizing transport project from the beginning, we said we want, don't want to look at only the CO2, but we want to understand what's the impact on safety, what's the impact on access, uh, connectivity, and so on. So we, we, we assessing these if those have been put forward in the studies. And we also take a look at what are the possible negative effects, where they may be in parking pricing, may shift the location of parking demand rather than reduce car use, et cetera. So we're trying to identify that. And we list some studies that are basis for, for this analysis in, in that as well. So this is really, we feel again, is a, a, a tool for us to disseminate the information and, and to get engagement from the partners, but further on from the wider audience on what works and what doesn't work. In my vision, we would have here a button that says, submit your effective policy, and anyone can submit a policy, and then we get information on that if we miss something. Now, going to the game, as Jose put, the simulation tool. 
So this is um, how it looks at the moment. Uh, we have the, the CO2 emissions on the left side for different regions. And we have at the moment the passenger kilometers for the same region for the cities in that region aggregated. Uh, we, at the moment, we're thinking of putting at least the mode shares and the costs in included in, in, the, in the one. But again, we will be talking to our partners. What should we be doing different here and what should we add here as well? And what would be useful? And you can choose a, a mode, you can choose a region, and, and start looking at what are the baseline emissions. Here we have, and, and then on the right, we have the, the, the measures that were presented on the, on the previous uh, part on the explore policy measures. So we can look at economic measures, parking pricing, and, and start looking at what will happen if I introduce a policy on my city or in my region. So let me give an example. Uh, let's assume that you're working in a city or a country and you have the carbon budget of which is now here 250 million tons on the, on the yellow bar. And you have an objective of we should reach about 130 million tons. How do I get there? What do I need to do to, be, to get there? So you start doing, uh, okay, let's start with the parking pricing. Increasing parking pricing by 25%, how far do we get? Uh, we get to 241 million tons. Okay, it's a good start. Let's start going through some other things. Let's start with technology, actually, because we know that technology has a lot of potential going with here, assuming the two degree scenario from the IEA uh, on, on a penetration rates for electric vehicles, hybrids for passenger mobility in cities. How far will it get us? It actually get us pretty far in terms compared to the baseline. And with the parking pricing being 25 percent up uh, and, and with that technology penetration rate, we get to 153 million tons of CO2 emission reduced. So getting closer, um, what else can we do? Um, we can look at maybe increasing the bus network coverage in these cities uh, to the density in line with the EU expansion patterns. Uh, actually only one million tons of CO2 reduced. Perhaps in this case, Latin America already has a, a relatively large bus network. Whether it's effective or not, that's another question and we can look at that. But it doesn't seem to produce such a major additional impact to what we already have. So maybe we can look at something else looking at integrated land use transport planning, um, increasing the tens density despite or in, uh, actually keeping the urban area relatively constant compared despite the population growth. And we actually see uh, quite a major uh, dec um, reduction and we almost got to our 130 million ton, 134 million ton reduction target at the moment. Uh, but interesting also, we see the uh, quite significant decrease in the mobility as the, as the densities grow, the average distances in the cities will, will decline and, and you see the impact on mobility, uh, passenger kilometers as well. And well, then let's try again, final thing, let's put parking pricing 50% above and yes, we get to 129 million tons of CO2 emission. So we kind of reach our target. Uh, this is just a very simple simulation and example uh, what, what I did here. Uh, but, but the idea here really is that we would hope this tool to al al allow for the stakeholders to, to get their hands on it at a certain point and start looking at how can I get to my objectives? What do I need to do? And, and as we move forward, we can really then um, uh, start using this tool on a more broader level. So that's for my presentation for now. And turn to, back to Jose. This was rehearsed. The numbers are real, but we don't expect our partners to play the game so quickly. Because there's an element of discovery. There's a an element of emotional engagement. What we wanted to get here is to have an instrument that gives you the willingness to play it. It was designed to be like a game, as I said before. We could have put all of this in an Excel sheet. It would be boring. We want to have this lively so that hopefully when you show it to the minister or to the mayor, the reaction will be, could I try my own moves? Maybe we can have this combination. Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? And hopefully in one or two hours, they will not feel the time pass because they've been so emotionally engaged. 
That is something that we learn from psychologists. That people, when they're actively engaged in doing some game in which they find an interest, they don't feel the time pass, and they get emotionally attached on that. And this is the way that we can get them politically involved in this search, instead of asking you, bring me a report to say what I have to do. Because in the end, there's a lot of political choice here. Let me <coughs> share with you something that we've had. We've already made two kind of warm-up presentations of this before being here to do with you. About 10 days ago, we were with our corporate partners in Paris. And yesterday, we were with the multilateral development banks. And in both sessions, the same question came. Could we not do an optimization of this? And the answer is, no, we won't. We could, but we won't. Why? Because to do an optimization, you not only have to have the costs, and that's an element that we will add there, but you would have to have an explicit ranking of the political preferences and of the financial implications and of the social capacities. I've worked for more than 30 years with ministers and mayors, and there is something they will never tell you. They will never tell you, this is for me two times more important than the other one, and this is the other, but they will not tell you. Because they don't have this algorithmically formulated even in their mind. They will know what they prefer when they see it. But even in their mind, this has to go through a process of exploration. If we want it to be um, uh, proactive, so sorry, the, the, if we wanted to give decisions or pre-decisions to the ministers and mayors, we would say, go in this direction, and the optimization could be good. We find that would be an element of loss of trust in our work. The political framework has to be done by the political decision makers. The role of the ITF is to make the calculations easily available, to see what are the expectable consequences if you decide A, if you decide B, if you decide A plus B. That's where we want to go. Now, according to the program there, it's views from project partners, and I would like to invite to come to the stage the project partners that have accepted to speak, and then at your choice, you can speak from the chair or from the lectern here. So, Graham Doyle from Ireland, please. Ireland was the first country to say, yes, we're with you, so thank you. Then Dr. Chang Won Lee, the president of Koti in Korea, Korea, please. Marc Frequin, Director General for Mobility in the Netherlands. Marc Ribot from Abertis in representation of the Corporate Partnership Board. We're almost 30 companies, so we cannot have them all on stage. Umberto De Preto from IRU. Jose Luis Irigoyen from the World Bank. And David McCollum from YASA. YASA is the International Institute for Applied uh, systems analysis, also an international organization. Is there chairs for all of you? Yes. So, uh, I hope those microphones will be working. And so, as I said, depending on your choice, uh, speak from there or come here. Uh, first, and by, the order will be the order in which I called you. So, Mark, so, Graham, sorry. Right, Jose, I think this is working, is it? Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I suppose, look, as Jose said we were an early uh, sign up to this particular project and that's because we saw it as a really strong opportunity to um, I suppose to learn from others uh, around our particular challenges uh, in this topic so this particular project I suppose gives us a uh, gives us an opportunity to do that in Ireland in our transport sector I suppose we have um, we have a number of decarbonisation challenges presenting to us and some of us some of those are outside of our own area of, 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 of expertise. So from a, we have a very large agriculture and food production sector. It's, um, it's quite an efficient sector, although I'd hate to admit that to them if, uh, if they were here, but they're not here um, today. Um, but with relatively limited mitigation potential. 
And that makes the challenge for us in transport and in other areas of our, con our, of our economy uh, around decarbonisation uh, just that little bit more challenging. I think it, it, it forces us to uh, decarbonise at, at a faster rate. Um, I think in terms of the dispersal of a very rural population, um, that gives us a particular challenge around um, bringing uh, public transport solutions uh, around our country, um, other than in some of the main urban conurbations. And I suppose over the last number of years, um, it's no secret that we've been quite constrained from an investment perspective, and that has, uh, that has given us uh, significant challenges, and yet growth in our economy is quite strong now. Um, and that's bringing with it some significant uh, travel demand challenges as well. So in signing up to, to, to work uh, with our partners on, on this particular project, I suppose this gives us a, a chance to learn. Um, uh, I suppose we naturally look to, um, to learn from the experience of our EU and ITF partners. And, uh, this project will provide us with some evidence-based uh, uh, data, information, and, um, uh, and to test measures, I think, in terms of what has worked uh, elsewhere with, uh, with those partners. So it's a, it's, a, it's a significant assistance to us in that, in that respect. Um, we've struggled in Ireland, I think, to, um, to look at those evidence-based uh, approaches and to, to, really, to really model what's worked and to try different approaches, and I think, um, I think this helps us address that. Um, so I suppose the last thing to say is just that we are very, very grateful to, um, to be able to participate in the project and to thank uh, our, our, our colleagues in the ITF for the opportunity, and we, look very, we very much look forward to working with you all. Thank you, Graham. Uh, Dr. Lee, you're next. Whatever you want, they are here. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Chaun Lee, uh, president of Korea Transport Institute, or COTI. Uh, it is my great honor to have an opportunity of a short remark here uh, in this decarbonizing transport session. When we discuss on decarbonizing transport, we should not skip today's uh, develop, developing countries' transport uh, problems. Uh, they are suffering from serious uh, urban transport problem with a significantly rapid urbanization. Moreover, earlier motorization in developing countries is aggravating the situation. Actually, uh, building a low carbon green transport system is important and urgent in the early stage of uh, their economic development. Uh, for all countries of today, transport sector is facing important changes in our future human life. ICT technology advancement pushes conventional transportation to move to the next generation of transport system, including the mobility integration. So it can be also very effective for increasing public transport use, especially in combination with a sharing economy, such as car sharing and public bike system, and so on. Among these innovations of transportation, the way to decarbonization would require multi-directional uh, efforts. COTI, as the, the Korean government affiliated institute, uh, we have made substantial efforts to ensure sustainability in transport in Korea. We are more than willing to share our experiences with all of you as member of ITF. To do this kind of activities, now I am very happy to announce that under the mandate from Korean Ministry of Land in Infrastructure and Transport, my institute, COTI, will engage uh, actively in the uh, decarbonizing transport project in coming years. And this will include financial support of 100,000 euros annually uh, to the decarbonizing transport program of ITF uh, for up to four years uh, from the Ministry of Korea. In addition, COTI will also cooperate in the areas of joint research or seminars, 
and building a framework for sharing information, data, and policy experiences for the project. I believe uh, this decarbonizing program is very meaningful and timely as the world has been aiming at more sustainable carbon-free uh, departments. Finally, uh, I am hoping that this event would be a, an important forum for decarbonizing transportation by exchanging uh, ideas and the best practice policy cases among the ITF countries. Please enjoy your session. Thank you very much. Mark Frecka from the Netherlands, from there, from here. It's your choice. If it is from there, pick up a microphone. <laughs> OK, thank you, Jose. Good afternoon. Thank you for getting the floor. Uh, four minutes, four points, if I may. Uh, first one, my compliments to you and your organization. For uh, I think it's not more than two years or three years ago, it was talking about hope and aspirations, and now we're talking about actions. And I wasn't aware uh, that it could also be fun. This is the first time I have an international meeting and somebody is talking about fun, what we're trying to do. So that's giving hope as well. But uh, we're talking about action. That's one. Uh, second one, uh, we love to be a partner of uh, your project. And I do invite all the others that didn't take the decision to join. For I think it's necessary that we have a big group to make progress. ITF is in the heart of transport policy. And uh, now sustainability is in the heart of transport. So the Netherlands wants to be in the heart of this project. So thank you very much for the opportunity as well. My third point is, uh, and I, was it, I saw it in the model, it should be having a broad scope. It's not only about vehicles, it's not only about fuel, it's about infrastructure, but it's also about behavior. It's about not only cars, they get a lot of attention, of course, but it's also about shipping and aviation. So I do hope, and I, I enjoyed the presentation about the model, that it will have that broad scope. My final point uh, is we noticed making the Amsterdam Declaration on, uh, on uh, uh, automated driving th that you can't get progress if you don't join forces. So in Europe, we joined forces and it's, it's working. And I'm very glad it's a cooperation between industry and, uh, and, 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 and public sector commission and, 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 and countries. But we also noticed at a national uh, level where we have a plan to uh, improve the options of biking. Uh, the Netherlands is already a number one uh, biking country, but we want to be even better and we join forces. So uh, I will end up with the line everybody knows, alone you go faster, but together you come further. Thank you very much. <laughs> now Mark Ribot. Mm, I, like, I would like to start by thanking the organization for inviting Abertis uh, to represent the Corporate Partnership Board that has been supporting the decarbonization of transport projects from its inception. Um, as the statistics show, uh, the, the transport sector is increasing its share of uh, CO2 and other pollutants in the atmosphere, despite deficiency improvements. And uh, this is because the, the growth in mobility worldwide does not offset the improvements. As a representative of the private sector, we believe that uh, we have to be, we want to be, and to, to find and be part of the solution of uh, the decoupling of uh, mobility growth and the negative effects of transport. Therefore, it is very important to participate in this kind of project that uh, identifies measures and that promotes the right set of transport policies to achieve this. And it is also an opportunity for the private sector to, to work uh, with the administrations to close the, the, the investment gap in infrastructure that uh, has, uh, has been estimated in $90 trillion dollars and, well, Mm, th already, the private sector is investing more, and it's uh, it's uh, reaching uh, mm, records, uh, yearly records. But still, much more needs to be done. And at Abertis, we invest, and we believe that uh, we have to engage in an active uh, dialogue with the administrations, with public organizations, with NGOs, 
uh, for instance, partnering with the UNESCO, also soon with uh, UNICEF, in order to satisfy society's needs and to promote uh, growth for all stakeholders. Um, also, through our industrial role, we invest in technology. For instance, uh, we promote, well, you, we use uh, drones and sensors to monitor critical infrastructure. We also uh, use uh, dynamic uh, pricing for for mobility in, in managed lanes. And these are already uh, innovations that, that work and make our roads more efficient. Moreover, we invest in, in projects and in research, such as the um, uh, trial of inductive charging for electric vehicles that uh, drive while driving in our roads. And, um, well, um, generally we are, we are committed to, to satisfy people's mobility needs, and which we think, we all think that it is a, is a value for society. And we try to do that, giving a better, faster, and safer roads. As Francisco Reynes, our CEO says, we believe that the key to unlocking progress lies at the intersection of advances in technology and innovation in road infrastructure. But, well, we are conscious that we are still far from, from solving the issue of decarbonization, but we have to be ambitious and advance through public-private partnerships in the development of a more sustainable transport. I do have the feeling from participating in this type of forums that, uh, that the transition to a sustainable economy is unstoppable. And, uh, and that is just a matter of when and how it's going to happen. And as renewable energy becomes cheaper than fossil one, as uh, um, autonomous and connected vehicles become a reality, or digitalization of construction, among other trends, uh, give us the feeling that, that disruptive uh, changes are virtually around the corner in the transport sector. So thank you, and keep up with the project. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Humberto? Thanks, Jose. L let me start with a story I don't think I've ever told you. In, in 95, when I joined the RU, uh, I, I said the road transport industry should adopt a charter for sustainable development. And I think at that point, some were probably asking, who hired this Canadian tree hugger to come join us? And in fact, what, what the challenge was, was to get the membership to understand that sustainability equals profitability. And when you can show that equation, then it, the, the challenge is uh, lessened. And, and I'm very proud that since then, if we look at our vehicles and what we're using on the road, today we have vehicles in terms of toxic emissions are 98% less uh, emitting. Uh, in many cities, based on the, the quality of the air, the, the air coming out of the tailpipe is actually cleaner than the air going in. So, so we are progressing. I think. We, we can't ignore the progress that's been made. We do understand that their challenge is CO2. And, and the RU is taking up that challenge, and we're saying by 2030, we want to reduce our CO2 emissions by 30%. Now, it's challenging, but it can be done. And indicators like this, and, and for this we salute to the ITF, and this is why we're very much uh, committed to this. I like what you said earlier, uh, that uh, politicians have to take political, make political choices. What I love about this project is it depoliticizes it. It shows numbers. And unfortunately, in the past, we've seen that there have been great options available to politicians, but because of politics, they don't follow it. Simple example, a few years back, we had in front of this building here a 25.25 meter bus, and right beside it, a 25.25 meter truck with two, of course, two containers. It's called a modular concept. With that truck, you can reduce emissions by 30%, but because of politics or the protection of one mode over another, we said, no, no, that's, that's not we. Others, politicians said, no, no, this is not a solution. I'm sorry, it's a no-brainer solution. If a bus can go inside a city center, why couldn't that truck? So you have to put to the politicians these options and depoliticize it, but they have to take the political decisions at, at, at the end. There are other issues that we can say if we train our drivers, and we have many drivers who say, oh, I'm a fantastic driver. And then we train them, and actually they reduce their emissions by 
And, and by doing this, again, the, the sustainability equals profitability. We reduce our CO2 emissions. Guess what that means for us? Reduce fuel consumption. That means more money in the pocket. Maybe it's not altruistic, but this is what will drive it, will motivate it. You have to show the, the, the bottom line figure as well. Um, there are a number of other issues as well, buses and coaches. By using buses and coaches, you can take 50 cars off the road. This is a no-brainer solution. Uh, and this is why we really try to promote the use of effective use of buses and coaches. And also what I like about this whole project is that some modes that are claimed to be cleaner than others, when you actually look at where the energy source is coming from, maybe they're not so clean. And I like the fact that we include all modes in this so that politicians will have a very clear choice which is the best way to move a good or a person from point A to point B. And with this, it's not politics, it's numbers. And then they can take the political choice based on numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Three comments. Uh, first, why we supported this project from the very beginning and it's so relevant for us. Uh, for the bank, uh, climate change is one a defining uh, development challenge of today and uh, the effects will disproportionately affect the poor. So for us, it's a top priority. To the extent that we have now a target, uh, how much of our lending supports climate change, both mitigation and adaptation. In that process, we are measuring, like uh, many other multilaterals, green, uh, greenhouse emissions of our projects. And one of the key features is you need to develop methodologies. But the more you move away from the basic infrastructure interventions, you realize that uh, you lack the analytical tools in order to assess the impact of certain policies. So this, in, this uh, model comes and fills that vacuum very nicely. Similarly, we are supporting carbon pricing and other initiatives that say look at uh, making more transparent decision making. Again, this uh, tool reinforces that point. The second, the second point, we like really very much the level of ambition. Why decarbonizing transport? Uh, the reality is that what we are seeing is an explosive growth of transport activity in the developing world. You go to India, growing at 7% say for like uh, 10 years. Household investments in, in transportation will go up uh, dramatically. There are studies that throw more than 300%. So you cannot think of a, a sustainable uh, approach in which you keep the status quo. You need to make sure that not, not only you meet the targets for 2030, but that you are not locked in in an unsustainable path that will make impossible, as you, say, you were saying, meeting the, the targets in 2050. So actually, we need really to decarbonize uh, the sector. And the moment you do that, you start realizing say, how we link with other agendas. If we are going to rely on uh, electric vehicles, what about, say, energy, renewable energy? So carbon prices, pricing that was not that relevant, perhaps, for transport becomes very relevant for transport when you think it's uh, make a good sense uh, to create a renewable market. So there are those cross uh, linkages uh, with other agendas. And the third uh, point is uh, the need for this uh, analytical tool to be able to model uh, the kind of policies that we see in the transport sector that could uh, give a sense of uh, what are the co-benefits, what else are we achieving. In many countries, we are seeing so that the entry point, for example, could be reducing congestion as a result of air pollution and so on, and then you have the side benefit of reducing emissions. So having a tool that doesn't come as a side uh, product of all the models that are more, for example, linking just uh, to energy, that uh, can model what we see as the set of interventions, including complex ones, like uh, uh, Jairo was su suggesting, uh, for example, compact cities, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's essential for us. We are, um, we are seeing also that uh, in the transport sector, local, country or national and global issues are very well connected. So having the ability to work at the city level, but also to aggregate into national policies, supporting those efforts, and then an aggregate level to see are we getting to the two degrees or, or we are exceeding or what is the, the, the aggregate level of all these uh, interventions. This is very important and uh, it's a, uh, it's, it's a vacuum that we had. We believe that this could become um, a standard, like uh, we did several years ago, the economic analysis, for example, in the road sector with the HDM. We believe that we need a tool like that that will make it transparent, the decision making, uh, and, and reflect the, uh, through this catalog of measures 
all this broad range of uh, issues that we will have to confront from, from now on uh, in order to move towards more sustainable path. Thank you. <laughs> David, the knowledge partners. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the invitation to, to be here as well. Yeah, so my institute, YASA, is one of the, uh, the 20 or so, I think, knowledge partners in, the, in this project. And as a knowledge partner, and in particular somebody who's engaged in scenario modeling um, myself, I, yeah, I really want to commend yeah, the ITF, like the other uh, panelists have said, on, 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 on the impressive efforts so far. And yeah, on the ambitious plans uh, for the future, but I, I think it can be done. Um, I mean, if there's one thing we know from scenario study after scenario study uh, is, particularly in the context of the IPCC assessment process, um, it's that aggressive decarbonization of the transport sector is, is vital, absolutely vital for meeting the, the stringent goals of the Paris Agreement. And, I mean, simply put, there's, there's little hope of, of, of keeping global temperatures to the two degree threshold or, or well below if the transport se uh, sector is not fundamentally transformed, so it has to be done. And that, that transformation is yeah, certainly going to take decades, but laying the groundwork for it uh, really has to begin now. I mean, we know this. Uh, the Decarbonizing Transport Initiative, in my opinion, is really a flagship activity in, in this area because it, it intends to do just that. It's really trying to help lay that groundwork. And there's three, three reasons why uh, I say that. So the first is, and, and Yari showed this uh, in his presentation, by synthesizing the, the evidence base on transport policy effectiveness in countries throughout the world, uh, the empirical evidence over the past decade or more, the ITF is really building this knowledge stock that others in both the scientific and the policy communities can, uh, can draw from in the years to come. Uh, and then secondly, I think the, the data sets, and Yari also showed this, the, the data sets that, that, that his team are amassing, I think, can be a really an outstanding reference uh, for other transport analysts to, to draw from also in, in the years to come. And then I would say third, I think the ITF is really utilizing some unique approaches to, uh, or at least they plan to, uh, for modeling disruptive technologies and disruptive behaviors. And these can serve as an example uh, for, for other uh, other modelers, other, other transport analysts uh, to follow in the future, provided that, and, and I think this is important, provided that that, that knowledge is, is disseminated through the appropriate channels uh, over the coming years. So if I were to give just, just one piece of advice to the ITF team at this stage, uh, it, it would be to, uh, it would be exactly on this point, this third point, is to, to really try to, to, to share the data, the, the approaches, uh, as much as, as is feasible, because I think this is a, m a major asset to, to others in the community. Um, yes, the modeling results themselves are, are, are extremely uh, insightful, the ones we've seen today, and, and the ones that will come out over time. Um, but but, but I, I might go ahead and say at this point that, that one of the more lasting and long-term impacts of the project could actually be the way that it sort of changes the, the general thinking in this whole area, the, the whole conversation. Uh, could change, and that's, uh, I think that's reflective of, of, in a way of what some of the other panelists have, have just said. So I think the good news is that I've seen already things moving in this, in this direction, meaning in the direction of this, this transparency, collaboration, sharing, uh, that's, that's great. Uh, we, we've seen it already here this, this afternoon. Uh, I know from personal experience, my colleagues and I uh, at YASA, we're, we're currently in the throes of rebuilding our own transport model, and, and Yari and his colleagues have been extremely helpful in kind of pointing us in the direction um, uh, of new data sets, so, so sharing knowledge, and, and, and we're trying to, to, to give it back, uh, so it's a two-way street. Uh, in the future, we, along with some other modeling teams uh, that do global transport modeling, are trying to compare our scenarios uh, with each other so as to understand the uncertain drivers uh, of what the future of transport uh, could look like, and so I think that's important, uh, and I'm looking forward to that. So, in closing, I would, I, would, I would just say I'm really excited uh, about this project and, and how it's going to develop from here. And so, uh, thanks a lot. I look, look forward to staying part of it. Good. Thank you all. Could I invite you to come back to your table? We still have the questions and answers from the floor. Um, let me start with another question that came up yesterday. Can we, have, can we see results for a particular country? Can we see results for a particular city? And the answer is only if you are representing that particular country or that particular city. Because those zooming in operations can be very sensitive. 
we want to be helping the countries. We don't want to be pointing fingers. And so the results that will be available for public site will always be by continent, those six continental areas that we have there. It's like you don't publish statistics at the level of a building because it would be very intimate. Here it's the same thing. But the results that you saw there, they are the consequence of the aggregation from city to city to city and then from country to country. So when, if and when we are working with a particular country, we will be having the results for that country and for the cities of that country. Those are already there, we're just not showing them. But this is, I said, as I said, very, very important so that those stakeholders, the political decision makers, can feel the trust that we are preserving their, let me call it intimate information about what things are going on there and what are the measures that they could be taking. I will be asking my colleague Yari to take my place here. I'm sorry I have to leave you. My time during these days is organized in slots of 15 minutes. And I now have to go because I have the opening plenary very soon and I have to start preparing for that. So thank you all for having been here. I hope the session next year will even be more exciting and that you have gained some insight into the project and that you will feel the urge to start playing the game as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. And, and I know that we're already behind the schedule a little bit, but I, I think there's a time for one or two questions from the audience, if there's any, uh, either to us or to our knowledge partners on, based on, on our partners, based on what, they, what you just heard. Please feel free if you have any, any questions or points. Sorry. Hi. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my name is James Kang. Uh, I'm from uh, Global Green Growth Institute. Uh, I'd like to ask a question about the uh, relationship between the NDC assessment, uh, which uh, you know uh, your uh, you know Jose uh, the uh, presented, and the urban mobility simulator. Uh, to me, uh, it, it seems to it seems that the current uh, mo urban mobility simulator uh, is independent of the existing set of the NDC documents submitted, you know, by you know plus hundred countries. So, if that's the case, uh, do you believe that the, uh, this model you, know, you are developing uh, can be used uh, when you know, those countries uh, update their NDC uh, you know, uh, in order to improve the, uh, you know, their commitment to uh, you know, the reduction of the, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions in the future? Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, absolutely, that, that's the objective of our, of our project really is to help the countries to go to the next step. Um, uh, and you're absolutely right, the current, the assessment we've done on the NDCs at the moment is, is independent from the work that we have in the model and, and the availability of you to try actually test different policies. But with that, we really hope to engage the countries and engage the decision makers to, to try and test what could be the potential combinations of measures that we can put in place that will actually get us to those ambitions that we have in the national commitments. Like, like Jose was saying in his presentation earlier, a lot of the commitments are, are ambitional. Uh, we will reduce our emissions X percent or improve efficiency, but how do you get there? That's, that's the main question. What are the measures that you could put in place to actually reach those ambitions? And this is what the project really is all about. Through the catalogue of effective measures, through the simulation, through the modelling work, to be able to identify those, those measures. This one. Thank you for the question. Maybe it's a good opportunity for me to jump into the next step slide that I have in here as well to show what, what's going to happen next and, and how we want to engage from, from here onwards. 
On the modeling side, just to really in the, over the next year, uh, we'll be finalizing our core modeling framework that we've been building so far. We already have, as I mentioned before, we cover all the modes of transport, freight and passenger, but we are improving the way we have costs, for example, in the, in the model framework. We are developing an urban freight module that we don't have yet, and, and this is something new, uh, integrating the sustainable development goals in the model, uh, and, and something we presented in the Outlook session just before this session, our new interurban passenger model that is really getting into details of how can we improve, what are the policies that you can put in place for interurban urban, uh, as, as well. Now, in terms of, the, of the, the simulation tool, where we are right now, we are going to be working on enhancing the catalog of effective measures for the urban policies, but also for the other policies we have. We are completing the urban measures uh, by the fall. So during this fall, uh, coming fall, we'll be finalizing the catalog of effective measures on the urban policy side, and, and then starting to build the catalog for national level measures. And, and